Oh, sorry. Go ahead. There we go. we go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm sure there's still people coming in. Um, if you'd like to, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, today, we are here to talk about accessibility, a super hot topic, especially with the Department of Justice rulings coming out recently. So thank you for joining us for our webinar today that's titled Achieving Distinguishable Text. My name is Jessica Young. I'll be moderating the session. I'm the Director of Online Learning and Instructional Innovation at Frederick Community College. Um, please post any questions you you have along the way in the chat. Um, I, Debbie has given us the go ahead to pop in and ask questions as we go. Um, and a little bit about Debbie, our presenter today. It's really a pleasure to introduce her. She has a lot of expertise in this area. Debbie is Assistant Professor of Health at Harford Community College. She is a Distance Learning Association Board Member, a Quality Matters Peer Reviewer, and a 2020 NISOD Excellence Award recipient. And with that, Debbie, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. So thanks everybody to coming out. This is part of our series on accessibility and we're gonna go through this information you know, in, in about 30 minutes. So like Jessica said, if you do have questions as you go along, please interrupt me. Um, I always turn my camera off when I start to present because I'm very animated and people tend to look at me and go, wow like look at me moving all around versus actually looking at the slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my video and share with you my screen. Let's see here. All right, I promise I'll do it in a minute here. It's for whatever reason, still showing Jessica as my screen too, but let's <laughs> see if we can do it. Are, are you able to see Thumbs up, yes. Okay, awesome. Let me get back into uh, what I want to see myself and we will get started. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about achieving distinguishable text. And you can see in this particular uh, graphic that I start off with, this does not look super great, does it? And this is what a good example of text that is is not exactly distinguishable. So what I'm going to do is is kind of give a review as we go along just to make sure that everybody is on the same page with terminology. And so um, give me a second here. And I do, I also should say that, whoops, let me move you guys out of the way, that um, if you hear me pause intermittently, it's because I have a tendency to dry out. And so this is me taking drinks of my of my Diet Coke as we go along. So let's see, here we go. All right, so what does distinguishable mean? And, and this comes from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and they give some very good definitions of what these things mean. And so this is about, this distinguishable text is part of perception. That's one of the guidelines. And that means that I can perceive what digital content is being shown to me, whether that's text or an image or video, all of the digital stuff that we put up in our courses and online. So distinguishable means that I can separate the foreground information, in this particular case, that's the black letter A, from the background. And then of course, on the second page, it is the, the black surrounding the white A. And color, so what I should first say is that color itself is not exactly the problem. It's when it is used for four specific things, that's when it becomes a problem. And that's to indicate an action, distinguish a visual element, convey information, and prompt an action. And I'm gonna give you examples of all of these. So, we want to look, we don't want to use color as a way to indicate an action. And what that means is do something with the digital content. So in this particular case, and this is also not great because it says click. And if you were in any of my previous webinars, you know that we really want to move away from using the word click because not every learner uses a mouse. So even if it said select the green arrow to continue, 
this would still be a problem for people who have a visual impairment, particularly if they cannot distinguish between colors. And there's many different versions of this that have super long Latin based names. So I won't get into exactly what those different um, dis disorders might be or impairments might be. But in general, in, oftentimes it's the color red and the color green. So we don't necessarily, we do not want to use the green and in that particular sentence as well, because a person with a visual impairment would not under necessarily understand, okay, well, you know, this is what they see. And the question that I pose to you is, do we even need to have a text that says, select the green arrow to continue? And, the, and I believe that the answer is no. We can still keep this arrow green. We just don't specifically state that it is. And so if it is properly coded to identify itself as a hyperlink, an object hyperlink, and if the alt text in that image says next page, then a person who uses a screen reader is going to automatically know that that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to select that green arrow as a means of navigating to another page. And it's intuitive, even those of us who don't have a visual impairment, it's just sort of intuitive to know that independent of whether text is there or not, if I select the green arrow, I'm going somewhere. Now, the other issue is when we use color to distinguish a visual element. And I know that you can't see this graphic right now. I do have one that's a little bit larger and you'll be better, <clears throat> you'll better able to understand what I'm saying. But again, you've, you've probably heard me say, we want our things to be accessible all the time. But from a legal perspective or and really from a student centered perspective this becomes even more critical when we are assessing the student's understanding right they can't show us that they understand something if they cannot perceive it and so this is a, a quiz question it says it's the uh, missouri compromise line and it says Explain the significance of the orange shaded vertically lined states. And here's the problem. If I am a person who has a visual impairment being able to distinguish between colors and I look at this, I don't know what is orange. And you can see that there's actually two sections of this map that have vertical lines in them. So again, from the student's perspective, they're not going to know what, what answer to choose because they can't distinguish between these two sections. But we can fix this through word draw, the draw options, and we can take our, our image and differentiate by putting dots, polka dots. And then at that point, if we say what lines are vertical, even if the student could not distinguish between the colors, they can distinguish between this is a dot and this is a vertical line, okay? Now, the other problem is when we use color to convey information. And so for example of this would be, okay, I've got healthy behaviors and I wanna convey that red is not a healthy behavior and green is a healthy behavior. So again, on the right side, this is what an individual with a visual impairment will see. They don't know. They can't tell. Oh, smoking, I mean, hopefully we would know, right, that smoking is not a healthy behavior. But again, we in accessibility, we want to make sure that every single learner, every single student has equal opportunity at understanding everything that we put out there. So even though it would sort of seem intuitive, all right, excessive drinking is not a healthy behavior, we're using color here, and that makes it unfair to the person who has a visual impairment. Here's a way that we can now change this. We incorporate symbols. So what I've started to do, notice that I've kept the, the colors. I've still put red and green there. <clears throat> Excuse me for a minute. So it doesn't, it's not as much of a problem that I'm keeping those colors there. 
but now I'm putting symbols with them and that's going to help the person better understand, no, this is not a healthy behavior. This is also sort of within the idea of um, universal design that we give multiple different ways to communicate information. So in this particular case, I'm using both color and symbols. So I'm sort of achieving a, a nice balance there as well. <clears throat> we also don't want to use color to prompt a response. So here's a form, and it's telling me that the, the fields that are red are required. And again, I'm a person who cannot distinguish the color red. I have no idea where what you're talking about. So that's where we see a lot of this, right? The asterisks is where we'll put it. Instead of that, we put asterisk equals required. Very simple things that we can do. Now, there's also contrast problems. And to this day, it still is interesting to me that we will, I will go to a web page that is like horrendous. The contrast is so bad. Um, I see it a lot, unfortunately, in small businesses. And that's likely because, you know, they're sort of a homegrown web design. They might not necessarily have a professional web designer to create um, their content. However, I still will see it in people's courses as well. And I'm always shocked on the occasion where I will also see it um, in a uh, textbook, a, a, a digital textbook. Now, I can't even look at this. It seems to vibrate, right? And so this is just a, a this is a good example of something that we should never do. The virtual uh, the contrast here is really super poor. But there is a really great tool. It's the Web Aim Contrast Checker Bookmarklet. And I, I have the QR code right here. If you want to scan it, it'll take you to that bookmarklet. Bookmark, marklet. Sorry, that's a hard word for me to say. One of the things that you want to keep in mind is that if you're checking and a site blocks your ability to use this, you probably don't want to use that website. And I'm going to pick on Harford County Public Schools here for a second and show you what that means. Um, and again, hopefully you're going to be able to see this. Are you able to see my, my website? Okay, so up here, let's see here. Whoop. It was just here the other day. Well, we, we have a good way to, some you know, sometimes those bookmarklets will sneak out of the way. Let's go ahead and make sure that we can put it on there. So this is what it will look like. And again, you just go ahead and drag this link to the bookmarks right here. And it's probably going to say, Debbie, you already have that. There we go. Contrast checker. All right. So this right here, WebAIM, this, see how this all passes. Okay. But let's go back here to, this is Harford County Public Schools. And we're going to do a contrast checker. And do you see up here the content security policy? I mean, it's even, this is even poor, right? It's, it's such small uh, text but it's, it's being blocked, okay? So there are other times, I've looked at other websites, um, actually the Harford Community College um, Athletics also blocks it. And so in general, you know, if you are um, using, if you're using that bookmarklet to check the contrast and it says you can't do this, there could be a reason why, and you don't want to use that website. You want to pick something else. So text problems. This is the one that I see frequently in courses that instructors create. And I, what I should say is, you know, we've been talking a lot about accessibility in the context of people who use screen readers. However, there is another group of learners that this also impacts, and that's people with ADHD. They will oftentimes, if, if text is um, not following accessibility, they tend to skip over lines because it's just overwhelming content. It's also people who have visual processing disorders, uh, meaning like maybe they have a problem with sequencing, um, visual and foreground discrimination. That means that they can't differentiate between the foreground and the text. 
And it just looks bad, frankly. And so here's an example. This is this is just not good. I see this a lot when I review courses um, in the discussion board area. People always want to seem to use small text and cram things together. Now, I will tell you, um, I do. I am a person who has ADHD. And when I look at this, I quickly look away because it's just it's too distracting. It's too difficult for me to look at it. Um, there are screen readers that can um, make this font larger, but that if I'm a person who doesn't use a screen reader, I have, you know, another issue that impacts my ability to perceive this. I'm not going to be using a screen reader. This is not going to look good. And a lot of times if I, if I come across something like this and I try to use the zoom function in the browser, it just looks like it just is a mess. It just looks bad. It doesn't do what I'm hoping it to do. So that small font, then we have this, right? We've all seen this, um, and I'm, I'm not going to pick on them per se because I think they're delightful people, but HR is notorious for sending out emails that have a lot of this neon green, red and blue font. And we know that they're sort of um, aim, what their, their objective is to try to call our attention to things, but it's the complete opposite. It's distracting. So when I look at this, and it says the first journal entry, I'm going to go, wow, that is annoying font, rather than per say to myself, oh, the first journal entry. The other problem with that is obviously, as you can see, that green font, the, the contrast ratio is out. And then, so, so this is something that we also want to move away from, thinking that color will help um, information and text stand out. It does not. And there's actually a little bit of burgeoning um, uh, research out there because a lot of my colleagues who are in educational psychology are like, well, you know, we tell people from the beginning to use color as a way to distinguish. And what we're sort of thinking now is that as adult learners, that works when we initiate that. So if I'm the person looking at the text and I want things to stand out and I highlight them or change the, the font color, then it works for me. But when someone else does it for me, it's the exact opposite. Hopefully that made sense. Um, this also there's a couple, the couple things wrong with this. First of all, it's using underlining, which we know we want to move away from that because it can be confusing. It can seem like it's a hyperlink. Mm -hmm. But right, right now, what you're seeing here is a very limited amount of negative space. It's sometimes called white space. And that's all of this area here. And so if I'm a person who has a little bit of a trouble, uh, some trouble tracking text, this is really super hard for me. If I am a person who has ADHD, this I look at this and go, a lot of text, not a lot of spaces. I am more likely to miss an important detail. And so what we want to do, this the, the thing about this is it is very easily fixed. And in general, this is the recommendation that when you are creating text, you want to set that line spacing to 1.5 to 2. It's going to create, it, it's, it's very helpful for people who have issues with tracking text. We want to add that space before the paragraph and add the space after the paragraph. What I've noticed is in LMS, if you're using their negative, or I'm sorry, their native text creator, 18 to 19 point font is sort of the sweet spot there. In fact, um, what I've noticed in Brightspace is they actually, when you're using their text editor and you're creating content, they will actually put with the 19 point font default, like recommend it. If you're using Word to create, you want to sort of go with like that 12 to 14 point font. It's going, it just, it looks better on the eyes. It is much more um, easier for people who have cognitive and visual impairments to be able to perceive what you're putting up there. Mm -hmm. Now, 
that's what I have for you. And I know we went through that again. This is the, our intention is for this to be quick um, so that we do allow for time for people to ask questions. If you are interested, we also have a playlist on YouTube that goes through several different, very short uh, videos that give a bit more of, um, provide a bit more of understanding about what the student, the learner experiences when we make these mistakes and very quick tips on how to fix them. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open up to any questions that you have. We have one in the chat. Can the bookmarklet be used for just websites, online courses, or both? You know, that's a good question. What I have found is that it kind of, it, it does work for websites, of course, it, it, unless it's one that's blocking you. For the LMS, what I have found is sometimes yes, sometimes no. And I know that's not a super great answer. I'm going to go ahead and pull up Blackboard. And we're going to try to run it. Yes. So here it does on the home page. Now I can probably go in here. Let's do a little test drive. I've done this before and I've just found that it's uneven in what it does allow. For example, sometimes it if you have a PDF, embedded, it won't do that. And then of course, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll give an example here. This is a PDF that's a web-based PDF. Occasionally, it will not do that either. See how I just tried to do it and it won't pull it up. More often than not, it will not work. And so my advice with that is, you know, we're sort of moving towards having people use in their LMS their negative text editor rather than um, the traditional way where we create a word, we save it as PDF, and then we pop it up as an embed or a file link. Um, and the reason being is that, um, you know, if we're, it, some of it is the aesthetics of it. It just looks a little bit better. But if you're a hardcore person and you're like, no, Debbie, I'm still using the PDFs. That's what I'm doing. That's fine. But what you want to do then is in whatever program you've used to create it, run your accessibility checks on that before you save it as a PDF. Or if you are skilled at using Adobe to check for that for the accessibility, run it through that because then you can feel reasonably certain that when you bring it up into your LMS, even though you can't check it, it, it likely hits all of those buttons. Like it, it likely meets the, the accessibility. I'm gonna go down here into one of my shells and pull this up and we're gonna try it again. We'll run it through. And you can see, yes, it's good. This is all text that I created using the Blackboard native text creator. It's showing me that everything works. Um, I cannot be certain though, if I go into my learning modules, I'm fairly certain I have um, deviated, no, that's a video, deviated from what I have been telling you and wanting to put up a PDF. And so I'm fairly certain that if I try to run the contrast ratio, yep, won't do it. So I think sort of the takeaway here is, and, and what I've noticed, our, our um, institution is moving from Blackboard to Brightspace. I'm kind of seeing the same thing, meaning um, if a PDF, if I can't scan it um, with a contrast checker in Blackboard, I, it's usually the same thing in Brightspace. So if you're a Canvas user, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably the same thing. So hopefully that answers your question. We do have another question, Debbie. Um, okay. Do you have some examples of things that do look good based on these recommendations? Um, Why, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will show you mine. <laughs> so this is my nutrition course. And I'm going to go into one of my modules. Let's, let's go into the student view. There we go. And we'll go into our current module. All right, so notice that I have a table here. I have actually moved away from doing this because I, I feel like there's no really great way for me to make certain that my tables are accessible. So just keep that in mind. 
um, I have some things that are not, let's go into a archived module because right now they're all in the quizzes area. Go into here, it's probably gonna kick me out. There we go, let's try it again. So we're gonna go into this one and there we go. So can you see how there's a lot of white space here, right? White space here. Now in this particular case, I did go in and put a PDF in. And here we go. This is 12 point font. There is spaces between. And I'm using a lot more of the, um, let's see here. I'm starting to use more of the native text creator in Brightspace. Um, and that is because it is far superior to Blackboard. I don't know if you've ever used the Blackboard text editor, but it's a hot mess. And so let me see if I can, we may have to go through the um, authentication process here, but I'm gonna get into my bright space as well, because I think they're gonna be better demonstrations of, Yep. All right. So I knew it was going to have to do that. Don't you love the send me a push? <laughs> While you're doing that, I'll ask the next question. I okay. might be able to help field it. Um, will the accessibility tools in Canvas and Microsoft Office identify poor contrast or use of color information? Usually, yes. Um, if you run the accessibility checkers, I know it does a, a fairly good job in PowerPoint. So um, I don't know if every, anybody's really used Adobe to check for accessibility. It's really good, but if you're not used to, it's, it's Acrobat, if you're not used to Adobe, it can make you cry initially. <laughs> But the accessibility checker in Adobe for PDFs is really super good. And it will identify everything, contrast problems, all of that. Sometimes what I do with Word, when I'm not 100% certain that I am getting that from Word, is I will go ahead and save it as a PDF and run it through Adobe. So it's like a secondary. Because whatever starts off in Word as accessible or not accessible in general, when it's converted to a PDF, that carries over. So let me go ahead and give you, let's see, I've been working on this one. And these are all sort of very rudimentary, so bear with me because I am sort of in that trying not to lose my mind space of converting all of my stuff over. But this is a really good example right here, I think. See, this is 19 point font. Lots of nice web space. Notice um, that I am using bold to try to pull attention to this particular. Uh, and, and I find that if you are going to want to try to employ some kind of a technique to draw the learner's eyes to that, to the text, making the text slightly mm -hmm. larger or bolding it can sometimes achieve that goal. But here is an example of using uh, the space before, space after, and it just runs very nicely. It also performs well in the app. A lot of times when I look at how it, how it appears in the uh, web base, I will then go over and take a look at it in the app as well. Other questions? I don't see any other in the chat and we are at time. Um, so thank you so much for this presentation. Um, as Debbie mentioned, these are recorded and shared on the YouTube channel. So please do visit and I will share um, the um, certificate of completion of the webinar. If anybody wants to take a screenshot, Marjorie, if that's not how it's normally handled, let me know. <laughs> nope, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. And here we go. everybody able to see that. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> Debbie, that was great. Thanks. Yeah. Well, no thanks, Dan Jennifer. Jessica, that was great.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll see y'all next time. Yep. All right. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye. See y'all later.